Hello and welcome to Lever Time. I am Lever producer Frank Capello filling in for David Sirota. On today's episode, we will be sharing David's interview with Caroline Fredrickson. Caroline is a lawyer, author, and the former president of the American Constitution Society, who recently wrote an op-ed for The Atlantic titled, What I Most Regret About My Decades of Legal Activism. The piece explores how, over the last several decades, liberal legal activists have focused most of their advocacy work on social issues, such as abortion rights and LGBTQ rights, and by doing so have largely ignored issues related to economics or the restraint of corporate power, which in turn has given the conservative legal movement more money to pursue their own goals when it comes to social issues. So that interview will be coming up in a few minutes. For our paid subscribers, we're always dropping bonus episodes into our Lever Premium Podcasts feed. This past Monday, we published our interview with the music writer Robin James and musician Greg Saunier about the online music platform Bandcamp, which was recently sold to the licensing company SongTrader, leading to Bandcamp laying off about half of their entire staff. It's a really fascinating story about the corporate influence on the music industry. We actually took down the paywall for this episode, so anyone can listen to it, and that is on the Lever Time podcast feed. But if you want regular access to our premium content, just head over to levernews.com and click the subscribe button in the top right to become a supporting subscriber. This gives you access to the Lever Premium podcasts feed, exclusive live events, even more in-depth reporting, and you'll be directly supporting the independent journalism that we do here at The Lever. All right, we're going to get right into today's interview with David Sirota and Caroline Fredrickson. Between 2016 and 2020, conservative legal activist Leonard Leo, the chairman of the conservative legal network the Federalist Society, managed to achieve his decades-long goal of stacking the Supreme Court with conservative justices. As Donald Trump's top judicial advisor, Leo played a key part in the nominations and appointments of Justices Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Since then, the last few years of Supreme Court rulings have been devastating for women, queer people, people of color, and many others. This has, of course, been the central focus of the conservative legal movement over the last several decades. Now you may be asking, why hasn't the liberal legal movement been able to stop this? Our guest today, Caroline Fredrickson, was the president of the American Constitution Society from 2009 to 2019. The ACS is essentially the liberal counterweight to the conservative Federalist Society. In Caroline's recent op-ed for The Atlantic titled, What I Most Regret About My Decades of Legal Activism, Caroline posits that by focusing primarily on federal judges' records on social issues, they largely ignored their records on economic issues, specifically antitrust enforcement and reining in corporate power. This has created a sort of negative feedback loop in which the corporate class has been able to use the judiciary to accrue more and more wealth and power, granting them more capital to fund the conservative legal movement, which then in turn has delivered disastrous Supreme Court rulings on social issues. In today's interview, David and Caroline discuss how this dynamic came to be and how think tanks like the Federalist Society have indoctrinated a generation of law students through the infiltration of law schools, and how the Democratic Party's focus on identity politics have obscured the corporate power actually pulling all the strings. Hey, Carolyn, how you doing? Good, how are you? I'm good. Uh, I really appreciated your piece uh, in The Atlantic entitled, What I Most Regret About My Decades of Legal Activism, and it speaks to something that, that I have uh, lamented for a very, very long time. Um, And I want to start this interview by just recounting a a, a small anecdote. I remember back in 2005 when John Roberts was nominated for the Supreme Court, I had written a couple things about his uh, rulings in the past on economic and corporate issues and was, I, I had written about being surprised at how little that record played into any of his nomination process at all. That the Supreme Court nomination process was all about what we uh, call social issues and almost nothing about corporate power, nothing about economic issues at all. And I think Supreme Court uh, nominations have become that in American life, a place where where these these hot button important certainly important social issues take center stage but issues of corporate power and economics are often not mentioned at all now your piece in the atlantic talks a lot about this and you talk about it from the perspective of leading the american constitution society so let's start with that 
leading the American Constitution Society. What, what is the American Constitution Society? What is it supposed to be a counterweight to? Uh, how does it play into, uh, for instance, Supreme Court fights? Well, thanks, David. First, just really appreciate being on this terrific podcast. I've been a big admirer of yours for, for so long, and it's really great Thank you. to be together. Um, uh, and so, you know, the, 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 Fed, the Federalist Society is really the counter that uh, the American Constitution Society was established to, to challenge. Um, the idea is to build a network of, of legal professionals, law students, law professors, and provide a, a, a source of understanding of the Constitution and laws um, for judges and others um, that is um, a much different approach to the originalism uh, and textualism that is um, offered by the Federalist Society as, as a way of hiding their actual intentions, which is the outcome-driven orientation of that kind of methodology, which is, you know, give us what we what we want in the 19th century, you know, what we liked back then, and we'll make it the law now, um, as we can see with the gun decisions and so forth. Uh, but, you know, the problem was, was that we just didn't have the same expansive understanding of how to build that network and, and how to uh, lift up our view of the Constitution and the role of Congress in passing laws to protect us. Uh, and so, we were too narrowly focused, I'd say. We also just didn't understand the political hardball that they were playing on the right. And I think that's that's such an important uh, way to phrase it, that, that, that the Federalist Society is playing uh, uh, on all of these issues. Uh, and for a lot of the last 20 years, I don't think that's really uh, been recognized. Um, in your piece, you talk about the kind of the absence of corporate power, the absence of, of, of an economic analysis in court nomination battles. Talk to us a little bit more uh, about how that came to be, why you think th that absence exists when the federal judiciary is dealing so much with those particular issues. Sure. Well, David, I think, as you mentioned, the, the confirmation battles around Chief Justice Roberts didn't focus on corporate power, didn't focus on how, um, how Congress can effectively constrain um, monopolies, um, uh, provide regulations to keep us healthy, keep our water clean, the air is breathable. And instead, as you rightly said, focus on incredibly important issues, um, uh, social issues, but also, you know, how do we interpret the Constitution? Are you an originalist? And what does that mean? And, you know, he famously said, I'm just calling balls and strikes. That's all we do as judges. You know, but in fact, we missed this game. It happened long before this uh, in, um, in the Bork hearings, which I mentioned. Um, he ended up not being confirmed, but until the very last day of incredibly lengthy hearing sessions, I think there were 12 days, um, nobody talked about the role that um, Bork had played in destabilizing our competition policy, taking some very um, clear statutes like the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act that had been interpreted over a long period of time to bar consolidation, to bar monopolies, um, that were detrimental to um, to our economy. And with the way that economy was understood was not just corporate profits are going up, um, or maybe the cost of an item goes down for a short period of time. But in fact, the multiple stakeholders that uh, exist in the economy, and one of the most important pieces was in protecting democracy. Democracy is something that can be really harmed by the aggregation of corporate power. None of that came out until the very last day, as I mentioned, the Attorney General of Ohio, who happened to be uh, Charles Brown, who incidentally, I believe, is Sherrod Brown's brother, said, you have to pay attention to this because of all the things you've talked about, this is the most dangerous. Uh, but in fact, all of the, uh, the mines had already been laid and they've been blowing up ever since. It was Bork, it was Scalia, it was been Judge Posner and Easterbrook who helped develop this approach to the law that said, um, forget about what the text says, forget about that history. In fact, you know, monopoly is good. It was sort of the Chicago school taken into the law. It's called law and economics. Um, and it's taught in all the law schools now. It has permeated our legal academy and the interpretation of laws 
by judges. And you can get laughed out of the room if you, if you suggest to people that we should go back to the text and try and interpret the law the way it was actually written. If you're you know, taking them at their word that they're textualists and they actually believe that we should enforce the law, and they'll laugh you out of the room. And that includes not just you know, conservative judges, but also you know, progressive law professors who just drank the Kool-Aid long ago. Let's talk a little bit more about that. I mean, because cause what you're reflecting, I think, is a larger shift in uh, the Democratic Party, the Democratic coalitions, the, the left, of ce- left of center, uh, putatively left of center um, America, uh, with a focus on, more of a focus on social issues, uh, less of a focus on economic issues and corporate power. I think the question is, how much is the erasure of corporate power and economic issues from what America thinks of judicial politics, how much of that erasure has to do with the Democratic Party becoming more closely aligned uh, with big business, big corporations uh, over the last 20, 30, 40 years? Well, I think it's all really linked. You know, as you suggest, the Democratic Party has been, you know, um, drinking at the trough of corporate funding, um, especially after, you know, the sort of the floodgates opened with Citizens United, but definitely before that as well. But I'd, I'd say there's, there's, there's an interesting um, kind of dynamic here, which I describe in my, uh, in my piece. The insidious nature of this is that the corporations have been funding all these right-wing legal groups, you know, and not so much to drive their understanding of abortion, right? I mean, you know, ExxonMobil doesn't have a strong position on abortion, and even the Koch brothers don't really care all that much about abortion or LGBTQ rights. Um, but it's a really convenient um, mechanism to undermine other rights. And by that, I mean, you get those groups, um, you get people energized around the social issues. They vote. Uh, you give money to groups like the Federalist Society and the Heritage Foundation, which, which push for judges who conveniently are at least as right wing on regulatory policy and corporate power as they are on abortion. So it's like it's a it's for them it's it's a magic it's a magic wand, right? You give money to these groups, you make the the, the issue, the big issue that everybody wants to talk about, abortion. And while nobody's looking, you change the law with respect to regulation. And you know, we get judges from, you know, appointees from you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to training programs run by um, the guy who was the dean of George Mason Law School, which is now called the Scalia Law School. And so they all drank this Kool-Aid about how to understand the law. And if you look now at the so-called liberal justices when it comes to decisions on corporate issues, they're pretty much aligned, not always, but so often with the most conservative justices. So we're in a different, I feel like we're in a slightly different era right now, where I think there is more of an awareness of corporate power and economic issues in some parts of the Democratic Party. I think that's partially because of uh, political campaigns like the Bernie Sanders 2016 and 2020 campaign, a politician whose campaigns are uh, centered around uh, corporate power and economic issues. I think it's also that the economy has become more uh, economically dystopian uh, than ever. And I think when I read your piece about how those issues have been omitted from uh, the, or erased from the public's consciousness or the public's understanding of what the judiciary does, it it struck me that that what's so important about saying that is, is that it's being, being put into, that message is being put into uh, a world where I do think there's more understanding of how central those uh, issues are. But I would ask you this, for those who don't really understand how the court deals with these kinds of issues, for those who think that the court is just about abortion and, uh, and, and social issues, again, very important issues, explain to the lay, lay person who might not know how involved the court really is in all of those issues that I think lots of people think are for the Congress and the president, but that the judges have nothing to do with. Right. Well, I mean, there's so many areas that you can think about, but I'm going to stick with competition policy because that 
I think really illustrates well. You know, there was back in the day um, before Judge Bork and, and Scalia and the others crafted this new approach to um, anti-monopoly law, um, there was an understanding that the role of government was to protect us from the aggregated power of corporations. Um, and, you know, at the end of the 19th century, they adopted the, the Sherman Act that, um, you know, was the antitrust, right? It was to stop the big trusts. And, uh, you know, that infamous era of these massive consolidations of, of businesses that were basically running the country. And there was an effort to ensure that there were these multiple values. It doesn't matter. Sometimes a company that gobbles up other companies is going to give you something cheaper. All right, well, and that's what the right is trying to sell us, that that is fine. And that's the only value. But that's not what the value of those laws are. Because you know what gets if a company gobbles everything else up, it lowers prices for a minute, and then it can raise them right up again. But the other things that it does along the way is it eliminates jobs, it eliminates downtown, it, it eliminates competition, innovation. But worst of all, it eliminates um, the ability of all of us to um, be in charge of our government because they become the ones who run the government. Yeah. Now, what are the big ideas in the in the article you wrote uh, about uh, legal activism over many years is is about how the Democrats' choice uh, to uh, ignore, eschew, avoid economic uh, issues when it comes to the judiciary, how that's actually eroded uh, the civil rights that that the party's leaders have chosen to focus on. Ex- explain that connection. Well, so I think, as I said, these things go hand in hand that um, the the more deregulation that has happened, the richer the plutocrats become. The richer the plutocrats become, the more they can fund right-wing legal organizations and right-wing campaigns. The more they can fund those campaigns, the more they win. Um, and they win in all sorts of areas. As I said, they use um, the social issues, which some of them actually really care about. I mean, the head of the, the, the real head of the Federalist Society, Leonard Leo, is passionate about uh, about abortion, and uh, it's a fervent right-wing Catholic. Um, he's a member of Opus Dei. He's a knight of Malta. You know, it's just, he, and he will talk about that, that abortion is really important for him. But he also really wants to tear down what we call the administrative state, which is, uh, you know, all of the regulatory agencies that keep us safe, um, that um, protect us from from pollution um, and dangerous drugs and so forth. Um, And so, you know, this is a really a vicious circle because these things are really tightly linked. Uh, And the more they win, the more they win, right? So the more they win, they use these issues and they drive their, their victories at the polls, bringing people out, and then they tear down more of our protections and they get richer and richer. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, I'm, I'm slightly encouraged by the fact that economic and corporate power issues do seem to be uh, more uh, at the forefront of confirmation hearings and the like, at least of late. I, I remember, for instance, in Neil Gorsuch's confirmation hearing, these issues popped up once, actually in a very high-profile way, when Gorsuch was kind of uh, called to account for his ruling in a case about a trucker, a truck driver, uh, who a frozen uh, trucker, was, yeah, who was facing <laughs> the possibility of freezing to death, a- and it really focused the attention for like a minute on how these judges are actually shaping economic issues, how these judges are shaping um, the balance between uh, corporations and labor and, and the like. And then it kind of went away. But, I, but then in the Amy Coney Barrett hearing, uh, there, was, there was a lot more about um, some business issues, climate change and the like. I think my question to you is, do you think there's been progress in uh, – either some Democratic leaders better understanding and centering economic and corporate power issues in uh, the critique of the judiciary. Do you think there's been progress there? Has there been progress, do you think, in the public's understanding of how important 
uh, the Supreme Court is and the judicial system is in terms of not just social issues, but also economic and corporate power issues? Do you think there's been some progress uh, since the time that you were leading the American Constitution Society? No, absolutely. And I do want to say about the American Constitution Society that we certainly, you know, we're really concerned about bad decisions involving economic issues and labor. Um, and those issues have come up in, uh, in individual confirmation hearings. I think our problem is that we didn't see the sy systematic and systemic connections, that this wasn't just, you know, sort of, we know they hate labor and, and we don't like those decisions. But in fact, that this was a, a the theoretical foundations um, had been so undermined by a long a process of buy-in by the legal academy, um, so that you you're not even thinking about so much what already exists. Um, we're only thinking about trying to stop things from getting worse. So I'd say, but you know, in response to your sort of optimism, I'd say I agree. Uh, I agree that we've had Bernie Sanders, AOC, Elizabeth Warren. Um, Sheldon Whitehouse, is, who's really gotten into the issue of dark money coming into the court, a lot of people concerned about, you know, the, the <laughs> Clarence Thomas living the high life on the, on the, at the uh, expense of, the, of billionaires and Alito and, and et cetera. Great reporting that has been done for a variety of outlets, but I'd say ProPublica in particular has done some incredible work. And, and I think sure. with the Dobbs decision, um, with the Bruin decision involving guns um, last term, you know, I think people are really starting to focus. The Supreme Court's uh, reputation has suffered dramatically. Um, and I want to also just mention that President Biden has actually done something that is the most important thing, although not enough. But he has recognized what, what the right recognized. This is something that Judge Posner, who was a Seventh Circuit um, uh, Chicago School guy, wrote to the Reagan administration at the beginning of the, uh, during their transition to say, you know, basically personnel is policy. You need to appoint the right people and appoint those people in the Federal Trade Commission, in the antitrust division, and the decisions they make about how not to enforce the law, which is primarily what they were suggesting, don't enforce the law. Send out guidance that judges will find compelling about how not to enforce the law and through this process and through the judges they got appointed, they changed the law without actually amending it. Um, and Posner's suggestion was, you know, you fly under the radar here. If you fly under the radar by getting the people in place, they, getting the judges to hear the cases, um, getting the Justice Department to issue the guidance that says, basically, you need to understand this. We know the language says this, but actually you should understand it this other way. And that impact has been enormous, plus with the Federalist Society, et cetera, um, uh, seating the judiciary, the law schools, the law, they, they run programs for judges, for, for law professors, for law students, um, including, you know, as I mentioned, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and a bunch of Democratic appointees who go to very luxurious places to hang out for a week or two and, 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 and hear about Chicago School economics. Um, but, but President Biden has appointed a couple of people himself, who are um, about the policy, if personnel is policy, Lena Kahn at the FTC um, and Jonathan Cantor at the Antitrust Division, who are trying to re reinvigorate um, what <laughs> textualism in the context of antitrust law. Like, this is what they meant. This is what they sh how the law should be enforced. It actually is meant to stop um, monopolies um, from occurring and, and ensure that corporate power doesn't get too great. That's the whole point of the law. Um, and they're meeting, you know, a buzzsaw. Uh, but we don't have enough judges who appreciate that, not enough judges who come out of um, economic background who grasp the details. And, and that's why they all go to these these schools also. You know, they are on Captiva Island and then, you know, ski resorts. But in part, because, you know, they get these big cases dealing with antitrust or, um, uh, you know, big uh, medical malpractice claims. And somebody can, you know, spoon feed them economic policy. I want to get to to where this all leads to, which is how Democratic senators and a Democratic president should consider judicial nominees in the era of what's commonly called identity politics. Uh, and these are a series of, of uncomfortable questions that are that are not easy. But 
I'll just state it. I mean, we live in an era where I think the Democratic Party has chosen to prioritize identity first and foremost over everything else. In other words, nominees are judged by uh, their demographics in a way uh, that kind of puts secondary uh, ideology, it puts secondary um, sort of viewpoint background, right? Like, do you come out of the labor movement? Do you come out of, uh, or do you come out of a corporate law firm and the like? Those are, that's kind of secondary to identity uh, first and foremost. I mean, Biden, when, when the first thing that most Democratic governors, uh, the Democratic president will tout in any nominee is the nominee's identity. Uh, and so I think there is a tension there from that kind of politics to the problem that you've diagnosed, which is that you can have a uh, a set of judicial nominees that are demographically representative, better demographically representative of the country than previous a previous set of nominees are, but they may be not uh, uh, different and not representative of what the public wants on economic and corporate power issues uh, and, and all sorts of other issues. So I think my question here is, in the era where identity politics is so central to Democratic Party politics, how do you think a Democratic president or Democratic senators should propose nominees? Uh, what are the litmus tests they should look at in a nominee? Um, what? What are the criteria for the next set of judicial nominees uh, beyond identity? All right, well, I'm going to disagree with you a bit um, because I think there has been a much um, more expansive focus under um, President Biden's administration um, than under Obama's. Um, I, I want to and just let me let me interrupt and say I I do agree with that. I do certainly agree with that. That that the backgrounds, the sort of what parts of, of uh, what career experiences and the like that a lot of nominees have are much different and much better under President Biden than President Obama. So I just wanted to say I agree. Right. So the, they had really advanced people like Dale Ho, um, you know, who's an ACLU voting rights lawyer, others who have been um, in the civil rights world or public defenders. I mean, Katanji Brown Jackson on the Supreme Court was a public defender. Uh, for sure. And so I think those are really different. And I applaud um, President Biden for 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 expanding that. Now, where he has not done enough um, is around, um, you know, promoting candidates and nominees who have uh, a, a diverse background in terms of economics. Um, not enough labor lawyers, not enough people who have worked on kind of antitrust destabilization. That is, you know, trying to stop monopoly as opposed to trying to help Monopoly. Um, not enough people who come out of those uh, those areas, you know, trial lawyers who work on consumer um, uh, consumer rights and, and so forth. That I think um, you know are have been neglected, and I you know have called the administration out on that. And I think uh, I think they're they're hearing it. Uh, I'd like to see some results. But I you know I I guess I think that the demographic diversity has been really important, but it can't be the solo um, condition. And the best thing that we have is we want to cast a wide less wide net for the best possible people who represent America, both in terms of our demographic diversity, but also in terms of our right to live in a democratic society where, you know, Amazon doesn't, isn't the only place we can buy anything. And the only jobs in town are, are, um, are run by the one big corporation um, that McDonald's can, 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 can force you to a n not, you can't be, you have to sign a non-compete clause to work for McDonald's when you're a fry chef. Um, you know, we, we need to have our rights better protected, and that means that the, that, the, that the demographics are not enough. The diversity has to include people understand that. Carolyn Fredrickson is a senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. She served as the president of the American Constitution Society from 2009 to 2019. She wrote one of what I believe is one of the most important pieces that I've read in a very long time, and I shared it with, with many of my uh, friends and colleagues saying exactly that. The piece was entitled, What I Most Regret About My Decades of Legal Activism. It talks about, effectively, the erasure of economics and corporate power issues from how uh, 
the Democratic Party, how we as America perceive the judiciary that is shaping those issues every single day. Carolyn, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Hey, David, it was really great to be with you. I so appreciate um, having the opportunity. That's it for today's show. As a reminder, make sure to check out our bonus episode of Lever Time Premium, which is not paywalled this week, which is our interview with the music writer Robin James and musician Greg Saunier about the sale of the online music platform Bandcamp. To get regular access to Lever Time Premium, just head over to levernews.com to become a supporting subscriber. When you do, you also get access to all of the Lever's premium content, including our weekly newsletters and live events. And that is all for just $8 a month or $70 for the year. Also, make sure to like, subscribe, and write a review for this podcast on your podcast app. And make sure to check out The Lever's other podcasts, The Audit and Movies vs. Capitalism. And of course, make sure to check out all of the incredible reporting our team has been doing over at levernews.com. Until next time, I'm Frank Capello. Rock the boat. The Lever Time Podcast is a production of The Lever and The Lever Podcast Network. It's hosted by David Sirota. Our producer is me, Frank Capello, with help from Lever producer Jared Jacangmayer.